the time, D-Day minus one. In this case, D stands for deer. By now, Texas hunters are at grips with a highly contagious affliction called trigoritis. A common symptom? Dreams of that trophy buck. There he is. Take steady aim. As the season nears, thousands of the more serious hunters began an invasion of deer range communities throughout the state. A financial boost to every town or city involved. Landowners on whose property the deer are fed and raised realize profits through the sale of hunting privileges. The takers, thousands of eager nimrods each season in the Texas hill country alone. Price for a good lease, $100, $200 per gun. Total hill country financial gain, more than a million dollars a year. But aside from having a price on his head, the deer has other values. Some are simple, like fellowship, recreation, and who doesn't thrill to a sight like this? Values that cannot be measured in dollars and cents. Time was, about a hundred years or so ago, that deer were less plentiful. Tall grasses dominated most of Texas. Woody growth had little chance to spread. Buffalo herds roam in the expansive ranges, unrestricted by today's network of highways and fences. Wild turkeys fed in the seed-producing grasses, then at nightfall, return to regular roosting places in valley woodlands. When one animal species multiplied too fast, nature had her own special way of harvesting the surplus. Mountain lions, wolves, and coyotes cull the weak, the sickly, and underfed, creating a wildlife society in which only the strongest could survive. Civilization brought some drastic changes. Cattle were introduced to most Texas rangeland in the mid-1800s. First came the rangy longhorns, and an exceptionally favorable market encouraged ranchmen to stock heavily. 1874 saw the beginning of an era sometimes referred to by historians as the Golden Period, a period in which the Hereford was introduced, with the distinction of being the first registered breeding herd in Texas. The nation, it might be said, literally cut its teeth on beefsteak and wanted everything from saddlebags to shoestrings made of genuine cowhide leather. Heavy grazing, with its shearing effect on the grasslands, opened the plains for an invasion of trees and shrubs, previously confined to moist creek beds and valley floors. The white-tailed deer and some of his friendly associates liked the change. As did others that were less neighborly. Though praying animals took their toll, nature had a way of doubling up on the replacements. For the most part, new additions thrived. Their choice habitat, grasslands intermixed with trees and brush, was growing. So were the demands of civilization. Bring in more cattle, the market's good, and if you're short on grass, feed them. Doctor them, brand them, and get them to market while the price is right. 
One day, sometime before the turn of the century, the golden period came to an end. As good grasses became scarce, many ranchmen turned to sheep and goat raising. These thrifty animals, unlike cattle, fared well on diverse meals of leaves, twigs, grasses, and weeds. Clashes were soon to come, a meeting of heads, you might say, but certainly not of minds. Far more significant, the second overgrazing cycle was just beginning. Sheep and goats eat about the same things and in the same quantities. Five goats or five sheep consume as much as one cow or six deer. A grazing combination that meant a return of food shortages, this time more complicated. Deer populations dropped when browse lines went up. Trees and brush stripped of edible growth as high as most animals could reach, even higher than fawns could reach. With much of the cover gone, losses to natural enemies became a serious problem. Ranchmen intensified trapping operations to protect their livestock. Deer herds also benefited, but faced a more deadly foe, perhaps, in the market hunter. To the men who laced the nation with cross ties and rails, venison, was there for the taking. Sometimes the slaughter was by the wagon load to feed the personnel at army posts. Deer herds were diminishing so rapidly in 1903 that the Texas legislature set controls on hunting. In effect, the taking of deer was at first restricted to six bucks a season. And these, it was further stated, could be legally hunted only during the months of November and December. Unfortunately, the law at this time could not be properly enforced. A young, understaffed fish and oyster commission had neither the funds nor authority. Had it not been for a handful of conservation-minded ranchmen, the native white-tailed deer of Texas might have gone down the trail of extinction. Acting on the authority of an old several times amended trespass law, the ranchman took action under the banner of a livestock and game protective association. The movement gained momentum in 1907 when the legislature created the Texas Game, Fish, and Oyster Commission with financial resources for game research, management, and law enforcement. But deer populations did not rise as if some magical wand had been waved on the conservation sky. In 1912, Commissioner I.P. Kibbe, reporting to the governor, wrote, As is recognized by the people of the state, the wildlife, which includes game birds and mammals, is and has been gradually decreasing. The slaughter has been fearful and indiscriminate. Even if they are preserved and propagated, it is doubtful if they can be brought back to anything like their former numbers simply because their natural ranges have fallen so completely under the domination of man. Commissioner Kibbe's predictions were only partly true. As for deer populations, the conservation measures, supported by a majority of the landowners, accepted by the general public, and enforced by wardens of the Game, Fish, and Oyster Commission, started the herds on a slow road to recovery. became re-established, sportsmen offered to pay for the privilege of hunting. Many landowners soon realized that leasing hunting rights meant a sizable addition to their annual income. As if in defiance of increasing hunting pressure, deer populations on many ranges continued to climb. The inevitable happened in 1933. Die-off. Areas principally affected ranches in the hill country on which deer numbers were at a peak. What brought the tragedy about? Some guessed that it was caused by disease. Others blamed it on stomach worms. 
biologists of a new wildlife restoration division began intensive deer range studies. These specialists, put afield by the Texas Game Commission, were university and college graduates, technically trained in wildlife management. Research work was underway when tragedy struck in 1938, again in 1942. As usual, death was no respecter of age. Neither was it a respecter of sex. Some of the afflicted deer were scheduled for study at the School of Veterinary Medicine, Texas A&M College. Postmortems revealed symptoms that were all too familiar, said one doctor referring to livestock. 90% of the time, the need for vaccination against disease is the result of an empty stomach. With deer die-offs traceable to starvation, the Game and Fish Commission attempted to reduce feeding pressure. Many surplus deer were trapped for removal to less populated areas. The project was expensive, and landowners, though generally cooperative, were reluctant to let trappers remove their bucks. Some of the release areas, a number in East Texas, have since produced some fine herds, but trapping as a system of controlling populations failed. The deer simply multiplied faster than they could be trapped and removed. Project 24R, Wildlife Restoration Division, May 1945. Subject, a bulletin to be titled, The White-Tailed Deer in the Edwards Plateau in Texas. An increasing rate of mortality points to the need for better range management. The numbers of both livestock and deer should be adjusted so that the range will be maintained in maximum production. Stocking should be done on a basis slightly below an average year to prevent acute difficulty in drought years. The bulletin was widely read by both landowners and hunters. What seemed at the time to be a simple proposal was destined to be one of the most controversial issues in the history of Texas wildlife management. Licensed hunters should be allowed to remove the excess does from crowded ranges. under carefully regulated conditions. 1947, another deer disaster. Some overcrowded ranges in the hill country lost 116 deer per section. Representatives from several affected counties concerned with overpopulated deer and die-offs obtained legislation for Game and Fish Commission regulatory responsibility. In 1953, the first public hearings were set to discuss recommendations for certain changes in the game laws. Among them, plans for an antlerless deer season. Kill my does? Well, if it hadn't been for my granddaddy and some of his friends, there wouldn't be a deer in 200 miles of here. My granddad protected his does. He didn't allow much buck killing either. And what was good enough for the old folks is good enough for me. Deer eat up everything I planned on my little place. I never get a nickel out of them. They're never out here in hunting season. I'd like to get rid of them. Yeah, I've got deer, too. Too darn many. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you can kill them all. What I can't understand is this. The game department's been protecting does all these years. Now they say we ought to kill them. Why? Biologists explained it something like this. Take a section of land following the usual buck-only hunting season. Say the deer population consists of six adult bucks and six adult does. 
or a total population of 12 deer. To stay healthy, these animals must have food. Let's assume the land, considering livestock grazing pressure, can feed 60 deer. 60, then, is the section's deer carrying capacity. Next year, there is a normal fawn crop, three for every two does, nine additions to the overall population, about half the newborn being female, the other half male. Hunting season comes, and half the bucks are harvested, leaving three adult and four young bucks, six adult and five young does. Beginning the second year, the young are past the nursing stage and require food from the land. The section now supports 18 deer. Late summer adds a new fawn crop. And by fall, last year's fawns reach maturity. About this time, along come the hunters, so chalk off half the legal bucks. Then early in the third year, last year's fawns become vegetarians. So the feeding pressure increases to 23 deer. Next, add a new fawn crop and count those born the previous year as mature. Hunting takes half the bucks, but grazing pressure increases when last year's fawns develop a taste for leaves, twigs, and grasses. The deer population climbs to 35. The fourth year brings a new fawn crop, followed by a maturing of the previous generation. Hunters take half the bucks, and older fawns enter the competitive food stage. Now, we have 51 deer on a section where four years earlier, there were 12. 34 fawns are born the fifth year. And with others reaching maturity, the count goes to 17 legal bucks, 34 adult does. Though half the bucks were removed, the new generation, entering the competitive food picture, pushes deer populations to 76 surpassing the land carrying capacity by 16. Now we see where a buck only harvest cannot keep deer populations in check. The Game and Fish Commission's recommendation to remove the surplus through a harvest of both sexes, said the biologist, is based on scientific research conducted on many areas. Much of the information is gathered on deer census lines. These are about two miles in length and carefully rooted over representative soil and vegetation. A check from the center line outward, about every hundred yards, indicates the approximate number of acres involved. But how far outward? As far, said the biologist, as the census takers might see the tail patch of a fleeting deer, or for that matter, as far away as a handkerchief might be seen in the pocket of an assistant. An accumulation of information gathered while walking such lines helps the game department estimate the number of deer per acre. Where the herds are not threatened with food shortages, it was pointed out, the buck law should be retained. However, going back to the fifth year of their example, the biologist pointed out that a harvest of all 17 of the legal bucks would not reduce the herd below the maximum land carrying capacity, and to do so would contribute even more seriously to an unbalanced buck doe population ratio. In this case, said the biologist, a carefully regulated harvest of both sexes would keep the herd healthy and vigorous at a safe range below the carrying capacity of the land. The hearings closed, in most cases with a majority of those in attendance favoring the plan. 
On December 1, 1953, the first legal antlerless deer season was underway. The hunt involved an estimated deer population of some 24,000 on more than 80,000 acres. Small totals when considering the entire deer range. But to a novice hunter, it meant a lot of footsteps. Yes, sir, here's a fellow with the odds all figured out. A deer every three or four acres. And by golly, looks like he's set out to cover them all. Maybe it's not the way an old pro would do it. But in this case, the technique brought results. Good shot. Venison steak on the hook. From surplus that might have been waste. And thrills for a hunter who, had it not been for an antlerless harvest, might never have had the opportunity to look down the gun sight at a wild deer. Attach a properly filled out tag, mister. And she's legally yours. Also taking part were some of the more experienced hunters. The best of them could spot telltale deer signs like a rub and be alerted for action. Many found the hunt to be more of a challenge than expected. Those that were lucky enough to escape earlier gunfire became as wild as the bucks. Among other benefits, the antlerless harvest afforded Game Commission biologists the opportunity to collect information never before possible. Check stations were set up at strategic points, and hunters cooperated by stopping with their deer in the interest of research. Legally kill doe. Weight, 72 pounds. General condition, good. Reproductive organs saved for biological study and turned in at check station. Metal tag affixed before transporting. Also, for the records, the hunter's name, address, ranch on which the kill was made, and sometimes interesting but non-essential information like, just topped this little hill, see, and uh, there she was, looking right at me. All told, 946 deer were bagged during the first season. Not enough, it was felt, to prevent another die-off. It started in 1954, in the midst of a severe drought. Venison steak on the hook. The surplus, waste. And a meal for a scavenger who might have dined elsewhere had man more carefully planned the harvest. If the drought served a purpose, it marked the turning point, perhaps, for an era of scientific deer harvest theory to practice. After the first antlerless hunt, more counties asked for Game and Fish Commission regulatory responsibility. Landowners found that brushing aside sentiment and tradition, good deer management, like livestock management, means the removal of surpluses in both sexes. 
and correspondingly, as conditions change, there is a growing need for continued research. A fire of unknown origin sweeps across three sections of a ranch in central Texas. Yesterday, the ranch supported a deer to every four acres. How many now? Chaining, root plowing, and other vegetative controls can sometimes benefit deer herds, opening dense brushlands to secondary growths of food plants and grasses. But where in the operations do the benefits end? And where does harmful destruction begin? Many deer are killed each year illegally. Others are felled not by the hunter's gun, nor by starvation. A few meet their fate in the midst of misunderstandings. A duel, perhaps to the death, for reasons known only to animals of the wild. To what extent do decimating factors affect overall deer populations? The problems might vary from region to region, county to county, or this pasture to that. Who has the solution? The man on the land, the man with the gun, or the wildlife scientist? Each must contribute. Their cooperation will determine the future trail of the white-tailed deer in Texas.